joining me. I'm just here to briefly discuss for three to four minutes um, a product called NC Care 360, which we're embedding in Maestro Care. In the context of screening and connecting um, patients who have social and behavioral drivers of health with, within the larger context to improve health equity. Um, so, do you want me to start the presentation now, or since it's eight oh one? Time. Let's let's go ahead and do yeah. that. Yeah. That'd be okay. So, as as we all know, social drivers of health are non medical, but they have a significant impact on readmission, hospital ED utilization, and where I see it as a diabetes doctor with chronic disease management, social economic factors, physical environment, health behaviors affect health outcomes by 80%, where the actual health care we give only affects health care about 20%. Addressing social drivers is a way to address health inequities. And as value-based value payment structures um, are being rolled out, our understanding and our ability to um, impact social drivers is going to factor into our success. So there's a new product out there called NC Care 360. It's been promoted by North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services. And Mandy Cohen really wants us to create a statewide social care network that all hospital systems use. Um, one single system is powered by a company called Unitas. And it's a robust repository of social and behavioral resources. But it's more than that because that's what NC211 is. It, al it allows you to electronically connect those with identified social needs to community and government resources. And it allows for a feedback loop for the outcome of that connection. Unitas is the company that has built this tech platform, um, and, but they're also a community engagement team that helps onboard community-based organizations, social service agencies, and health systems. We have four training modules if you'd like to learn more. The first is just what are social and behavioral drivers of health. The second is really important if you want to start implementing this in your clinic. So key considerations in implementing NC Care 360. And the first question is, are you screening for social drivers? Are you documenting where we want you to document? Um, what questions are you going to ask? Who's the one who does the data entry? And then who's the person? Who's the role that uses NC Care 360? Everyone's going to have a license. Physicians, nurses, social workers, case managers, care managers, students. Um, so uh, any of those roles could be the person connecting the patient via NC Care 360. The third module is emotional and cultural literacy. And the fourth is literally how do you use NC Care 360 in Maestro Care? We are live in Duke Endocrinology, South Durham Endocrine, Roxborough Road Pediatrics, Duke Family Medicine, Duke Raleigh Cancer, Infectious Disease, and Duke Outpatient Clinic. And we're going live this week with the clinics listed below and later in the spring with inpatient case management. We were supposed to go live with inpatient in the middle of February, but because of COVID, they're overwhelmed and just could not do one more thing. Um, and the anesthesia clinic is interested in doing screening to address social drivers before patients have surgery. Going live really does require a workflow for the screening for social drivers. What questions are you gonna answer? When in the workflow are you gonna ask those questions? We do have MyChart questionnaires and they can be put on tablets. That's how Roxborough Road Pediatric does it is through welcome tablets. And then if it's not through my chart or welcome tablets, who's gonna enter the data? In my clinic, the nurse enters the data. We have a paper form and then we have a social worker. My other three endocrine clinics, we don't have a social worker. So trying to figure out who, what role is going to use NC Care 360 has been tricky. Um, if you want to learn more besides the modules, we do have an intranet site and we have an email Duke Social Drivers at duke.edu. And that's the end of the presentation. If you want to know more, I've added an agenda with an additional uh, 35 slides um, that you can look at later. Any questions? Wonderful, thank you for, for sharing that. And thank you for jumping on to our early morning grand rounds to share that. Sure. If you'd like to do more in your clinic, just give us uh, an email and we'd be happy to help you start implementing this.
the for people who are interested in the CME code today, I'll share that in the chat. It's GEGJAF, G-E-G-J-A-F. Typically, um, those should be valid for up to about 24 hours after the, the lecture. Um, occasionally, the, the system will default to, to one hour. Um, if, it, if it does that, um, I, can, I can change that. So I, I like to give people a bit more um, time to put those in. And so thanks everyone. Rich is um, delivering food as we speak. It was a, um, we had to switch caterers for a week and I, I, I chose someone that's not so good. So um, thanks for your patience. Can anyone hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Sorry, everyone, for being late. We had a food snafu this morning, although I do have to say, well, the coffee is excellent. Okay, good to know. All right, everyone. Um, uh, good morning. Uh, looks like the weather is really picking up um, and the COVID rate is coming down so dramatically. I don't even have COVID slides today. Um, a couple we're of not, we're not oh. seeing your slides yet. Okay, sorry. God, I've been at this for a year and still screwing up. I can't share, Will. All right. Um, there you go. You should be able to. Sorry about that. Okay. There you go. All right. So, anyone who uh, works at the Maureen Road Clinic knows uh, C.J. Williams. Uh, who's a world-class bass fisherman uh, and, and is someone who just makes the place a joy to uh, work with. Uh, he's uh, this week's All-Star, no nominated by Lindsay Anthony and uh, by me. Uh, a couple, you know, real congratulations to Claudia Gonzalez Hunt and Will, uh, who were recognized uh, by the Dean for their commitments to the School of Medicine's Moments to Movements. Uh, uh, undertaking and to the committee. So congratulations to both of them. It turns out that there's a residence appreciation day. I think they should have a whole week, don't you, Will? Absolutely. Absolutely. And employee appreciation day. I don't know if that means salaried employee or any employee, but uh, March 5th is employee appreciation day. Uh, of course, thanks to everyone who keeps the department running. Uh, the department's had a new addition, uh, Zeynep Maryam uh, Parloturk was born at a hefty seven pounds, five ounces to uh, Noreen. What a beautiful little baby. Seeing pictures of babies like that reminds us of our own. And this is my daughter, Elizabeth, at uh, probably a slightly older age, but just another picture of awesomeness. So, um, You've already had uh, Susan Spratt, and thank you, Susan. Uh, so today's speaker is uh, Nick Hudak. Nick is the Associate Professor of Family Medicine and Neurology 
and Community Health, and he's the Assistant Director of the Duke Center for Interprofessional Education and, and Care. He has a, a distinguished career at Duquesne University and a master's from the University of Akron. And Nick, who's always a sunny presence uh, in the department, is going to talk to us today about interprofessional education and care. So Nick, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Rich, and, and thanks to all for uh, having me today to present on an important topic that is really a part of our everyday. And, and, uh, and I appreciate everyone being here and encourage you to participate this morning. I'm gonna to try to keep this pretty interactive because we all work on teams. And as you look at the title of this presentation, we're gonna talk about teaching about teams, but to teach about teams, we gotta know about teams. So I would say this is sort of a, a lot of learning about collaborative practice and then how we can teach the learners that we work with, but also teach ourselves and each other what it means to be a team and a team player. Here's the Continuing Education Code, G-E-G-J-A-F. I'll share it again at the end, and I believe it's in the chat. Uh, just a couple, uh, no financial disclosures, and one editorial one. And our objectives for today are to talk about the uh, principles of uh, interprofessional education and collaborative practice. Uh, I know this is something I didn't get much of in my own pre-licensure education and, and don't see it too much in continuing ed. So again, I'm, I'm glad we are making this a priority within our institution and within our department. We're gonna spend some time talking about strategies that we can do with our learners to facilitate interprofessional education in our clinical environments. And then we're gonna talk about how we as individuals, as divisions and as a department might begin to think more about how we can advance interprofessional teaching, um, but also faculty development and even research in this topic area. So again, teach more about teams. Um, if, if we're gonna teach about teams, we need to know more about teams. So that's gonna be part of our focus today. And that really begins by thinking more about teams and throughout our time here today, and hopefully even a bit after the session, you'll be reflecting about the teams that you've worked on and that you currently do work on because we need to think about our teams, but we also need to talk about our teams. And I know that this is something that we do with some regularity informally in our clinical practice, maybe at division or department meetings and in other spaces. But as we think about not only ourselves, but our learners, we need to engage them in that talk. We also need to engage them on those teams. And then we also, I would challenge us all to think more about researching about teams and collaborative practice as it relates to patient outcomes as well as education, because I think this is part of our charge and part of getting it right is, is researching and sharing. So I'm, I'm starting with this slide. I'm also gonna end on it as in terms of key takeaways. So let's talk about uh, some principles of interprofessional education. Some of this might be new and my hope is that I'll sort of widen your world to how much is out there in terms of collaborative practice and interprofessional education. So like all things, I think it's important that we begin not with ourselves, but with why we're here and that's for our patients. And I want everyone to take just a minute and think about the last patient you saw, whether it was a patient you saw in rounds this morning, pre-rounding, yesterday in clinic, maybe, maybe in, the, in the more distant past. And you of course had your interaction with that patient but it took them a while to get to you, right? What other provider did they see? Did they come in through the ER? Were they referred from primary care? Were they seen by a community neurologist in another part of the state or the country? So that person didn't start with you, but they did get to you in your own practice. Um, they may have gone through other healthcare systems um, and they may be presenting with a new problem or maybe an old problem or an old problem that's getting worse. But regardless of how they got to you, you had your interaction with the patient, but you know, um, well enough about the patient experience that it is a dizzying experience that our patients interact with many members of the healthcare team and staff to get to their time with us. So as we think about the patient experience and why we're here, uh, we need to be thinking not only about how we're interacting with the patient, but about the patient experience with the members of the healthcare team. And that's something that I do in my practice on, on Thursdays in the division of neuroimmunology. You know, one question I always ask my patients is, well, two, really, who's on your team in terms of, do they have a primary care provider? Do they have an established physical therapist? Are they seeing a counselor? 
family, neighbors, community. Um, but I always ask them too, near the end of the visit, who else do they think they need on their team? Because I have my recommendations, I have my problems, I have a sense of what help or what referrals they need. But I do ask the patient for their insights into who else do they need on their team. So that's one thing I want you to think about today is you're on the patient's team, um, who's on your team, but who's on the patient's team and how we can begin to work better together and teach our learners about that. Concurrently um, with all that, of course, our patients are interacting with, with staff, with administration, they're of course engaged with the electronic health record and they're in a complex system that doesn't always really feel like a system. So it's, it's tough to be a patient, it's tough to be a provider and I think that teams are part of the solution to both. So when I got to Duke 11 years ago, I came with five years of practice in general neurology, mostly inpatient up in Ohio, where I'm originally from. And I met with Joel Morganlander early on because I was able to continue my clinical work one day a week. And I'm passionate about neurology. I wanted to stay in neurology. So I met with Joel and I said, you know, I have general experience. I know I'll be in an outpatient setting now because I'm going to be one day a week. I said, so I'm, I'm, I'm new to an academic medical center. So I said, who needs help? And this is who he said needs help because Dr. Hurwitz had just been retiring and Dr. Skeen was going to be inheriting many, many patients with multiple sclerosis. So I said, well, I've actually heard that name because one of the neurologists I worked with up in Ohio was a, a recent um, graduated fellow from the Duke program. And he said that there were many, many great neurologists to work with. And Dr. Skeen's name was mentioned among them. So um, I had a, a chance to begin my work and, and join the team here at Duke, which was, of course, not just Dr. Skeen at the time, but we had a great, great staff and we still do. And this is, of course, not, not 11 years ago, but in the past years, you might guess. And it's been a real privilege over time to you know, work with Dr. Skeen and the 1L team um, and watch that team grow over time. Because if you all know about our division, we have had a team that has grown and grown and grown. And we have a clinic staff. Um, we have uh, you know, Amanda Cotton, our nurse. We work with farm techs and triage nurses and financial care counselors and social work and physical therapy. So for me, um, as I reflect on my teams, I think about my first five years, but my more recent not 11 years here at Duke as really not just being part of a group, but being part of a team and what a privilege that's been. And I hope that you're reflecting on the team that you are on, but also that a team that might be growing together um, and, and perhaps growing in size as, as our department continues to grow. So I want you all to open up your chat if you can, and I want you to just share either the name of a person or a provider type or a staff member who's made a difference for one of your patients. So this isn't you making a difference, it's, it's someone else making a difference for a patient that you care for. And I call these sort of chat bombs. So share to the share in the chat and watch the chat. So we're seeing some names, we're seeing some different professions, speech pathology, PA, physician, physical therapy, social workers, nurse practitioners, nursing, social work again. Staff, I'm a pharmacist, I'm a nurses, chaplain services. Right, so keep, keep those rolling in, right? So it, it's no surprise, we all know that different providers do um, and, and different staff do make a big difference for our patients. And I think it's something we need to keep um, sort of top of mind as we provide care, um, whether it's individually or as part of teams um, in inpatient or outpatient settings. And as we look at those names of people and professions, and as we think about teams, one, one thing that makes a, a group a team is having a shared goal. And the purpose of collaborative practice and interprofessional education is to improve health outcomes, full stop. That's it. That's why I'm here today. That's why there's a center for it. Um, and, and that's why, as I share with you, the organizations and the research, and we talk about facilitations, that's what all of this is about. I read in an article a few years ago that um, while none of us as healthcare providers are error prone, the healthcare system we are in because of its complexity is error prone. And that's all the more reason for us to have uh, teams that can work well with one another. Two big drivers of really understanding the, the need for interprofessional education come from National Academy of Medicine reports. 
One was from 1999, which you might remember is to, to air the to air is human report. And it identified among many things that new graduates, right, from pre-licensure programs are relatively unprepared to practice in interprofessional teams. Um, I, I graduated my program in 2004 and I would put my hand up to say, were you prepared to work on teams? I would be like, no, I was not. And I, I wonder how well prepared you felt um, to work on teams when you were trained. You may have felt practice ready, but did you feel collaboration ready? A more recent report from 2015 from the National Academy showed that poor preparation to work on teams contributes to a range of adverse outcomes, which you can read here, and you probably remember this report. So we have two big reports, among others, that show this is an area where we need to do better, and I think we can do better. Just as we look to those national reports, um, we, we know that our US healthcare system is moving in a direction where, as you can read here, no one individual profession or, or provider type um, can address all of patients' needs. I think the brief presentation at the beginning of this hour on NC Care talking about social determinants, I think also underscores this reality that we're gonna need uh, uh, more than one set of hands to do all this work. Also discussed with NC Care 360 is a reminder that we are moving from a fee-for-service to value-based care model and that uh, the team-based care is going to be a big part of the solution and getting that right. And as we look more broadly at um, innovation and the Institute for Health Innovation, um, you all are probably familiar with the triple aim or, or what now is oftentimes referred to as a quadruple aim, whereas we think about that patient experience. As we think about population health and even its new department here at Duke, as we look at the need to reduce costs and just as important care team well-being, this is, this is about us and the teams we work on and us taking care of each other. These are priorities and I, I think any of us would be hard pressed to figure out how we're going to address and, and, and innovate in each of these categories without a team. So just to clarify a few definitions, this is not a presentation on sort of teams and team formation and, and team effectiveness. If uh, we want that in the future, um, I, I have some close colleagues who would be happy to do it, um, but just to make sure we know what a team is. So what's pictured here is what's called the, the group team sort of spectrum, and it's not well demarcated like a lot of spectrums. Um, but uh, what I want to introduce here is that, you know, not, not every group is a team, and not, uh, but every team is is likely a group. And you can read here a definition of what a team is. There are hundreds of definitions of teams, including in the team science literature, including in the uh, health services literature. Here's um, a popular one that I wanted to share here. One, a, a couple things to think about is that oftentimes we think every group is a team and that's not always the case. Um, a, a group might be a people who work in the same setting, um, but it's really when we're collaborating together, right? When we're when we're talking with someone, when we when we sideline someone in the hallway, or when I'm you know when we're I'm, I'm looking at an MRI scanning clinic with someone, or I'm talking to our pharmacist about a plan of care, right? It's the collaboration, it's that communication where we become a team, and we don't need to be a team constantly, right? I think we're always a group, but we need to recognize those those moments where we need to be a team. And that might be during, uh, you know, dur during a code or a, a acute stroke comes into the ER or, a, you know, a patient who's having, um, you, know, uh, you know, recurrent seizures, right? There are moments where we need to, to pull together as a team and then we can sort of go back to being a group. But we need to be careful about not confusing the two um, and recognizing that to be a team requires a bit more work. To make things perhaps even a little bit more complicated, but hopefully make us think about why this is complex, I wanted to share just a picture of the team effectiveness model. And, and, and this again, we could spend a, a week on this. But if you start on the right side, just thinking about, you know, remembering that this is all about patient outcomes. As we think about the outcomes we want to achieve with our patients, we need to think about the work that a team or group needs to do. But then the teamwork is really how we do it, right? What tasks, what roles and responsibilities do we have and when and who does what? And I know that in our own division of neuroimmunology, this is something we've worked on as our team has grown with not only more providers and prescribers, but as we've gotten the benefit of working with the infusion centers and having a, a pharmacy tech and a, and, a pharma, and a pharmacist and more nursing staff and physical therapy, right? We've had to figure out how to get this right and how to, to maximize the services we can provide as we get more members to that team. And bigger picture, we do need to think about structure and function, who's on the team, 
Um, what, what space do we have? When do we meet? When do we convene? And then there's bigger factors that oftentimes seem far out of our control about the organizational context and culture. And then also what social and policy factors do we need to consider? And, and one of those is, you know, um, uh, not, not, all, not all providers get reimbursed for the services they deliver, right? So that's one challenge with delivering team-based care. So I just want to introduce those two concepts here as to provide us with a larger framework. So as we think about interprofessional collaborative practice, the definition is listed here, and it's all about that collaboration, that interaction. As we think about our learners, we need to think about getting our learners with other learners during their education in classroom and clinical settings, as well as with other members of the healthcare team. And our hypothesis, though hard to prove, is that if we get IPE right, our graduates will be more collaborative practice ready. And what I think all of us need to think about since we're, we're out there practicing already, how are we supporting this and how, um, you know, and how are we essentially advancing it versus creating barriers to it. Another framework I wanna briefly share here is called the Interprofessional Learning Continuum Model. And um, this is something we could spend more time than we have on, but really wanna emphasize right here, uh, sort of underscored in red is that Collaborative practice is all about a continuum, right? It's something that we start when we're in the classroom. You know, maybe we had an anatomy lab with a learner from a different profession. Maybe we had a, a social event or a service event with a learner. Maybe we were on a clinical rotation. There were PA students or nursing students or physical therapy or medical students present. Um, but it really does continue into our uh, practice and into our continuing education. And I think that this is where entities like the Center for Interprofessional Education and Care and Duke Ahead uh, can certainly work with continuing it as well as what we want to do in our own department. Um, so as we think about our learners, we don't need to get them, you know, perfectly practice ready in terms of collaboration, but what can we do if we have a student or a learner for a day, for a week, for a month, or maybe we're giving a lecture, what can we do to facilitate interprofessional education? I've shared that there are drivers of IPE that come from national reports and research. Um, there's a uh, interprofessional education collaborative, which is comprised of several national organizations that have actually drafted competencies for interprofessional education, which I'll share shortly. And then the World Health Organization has also had this as a big priority. There are also two journals dedicated uh, to interprofessional education, and there's plenty of IPE literature scattered throughout other professional journals. So um, IPE sometimes feels new, but it's ab about a half century old. And I think it's um, certainly, it's not getting old, but it's getting mature, which is a good thing. Just a couple snippets from the literature around interprofessional education specifically, and, and generally speaking, the results are positive in terms of it um, positively impacting students' attitudes about collaborative practice, increasing their knowledge about teams, increasing their communication skills. So emerging literature shows that IPE is, is certainly doing no harm, uh, helping to some degree, but like a lot of literature, including especially educational research, um, you know, it, it's limited and it needs to continue. Just as we think about the drivers and the publications and what we're learning from the literature, I also want you all to know that IP is organized nationally within institutions. I mentioned the Interprofessional Education Collaborative. Um, there is a national center based out of the University of Minnesota, which has a lot of great resources. So if you're interested in IPE or want to dabble, that's a great place to go. And they do have conferences and workshops uh, in Minneapolis and around the country. There is a Health Professions Accreditors Collaborative. So for all the pre-licensure um, education programs at Duke and really across all health professions are a part of this collaborative that have said that our students need to be collaboration ready. So this is not something nice we do on the side. There's an accreditation standard that mandates our programs teach about this. And in a little bit, we'll talk actually even about the ACGME competencies. And there are external funders such as the Macy Foundation. Just as we look sort of beyond our campus, it's important for, to remember that uh, Duke's most recent strategic framework asks us to be dramatic in supporting IPE in both education research and practice. So that I think that that, that charge will hopefully remain. And uh, slowly but surely, like a lot of things at Duke, we have been able to establish the Center for Interprofessional Education and Care. And I'll share more about that at the end of our session. So as we think about our charge for IPE and, and cover some of the rationale and know that this is something that is happening nationally at our peer institutions that I think where, you know, where our institution can not only uh, catch up, keep up, but also lead, 
I want you all to think, as you think about facilitating IP with, with the learners that you engage with, what are some of the challenges? And you can put this, share this in chat. So I see time. What else would be a barrier? If I said today, when you work with a student, you got to teach them about teams. Why is that going to be hard? That people like you might not, you might not see the learners. They might not see other providers or other learners. So space is a challenge. Yeah, what do the students need to know? That's a great one. I think sometimes we have a certainly have a better sense of what students from our own profession need rather than other professions. So that's definitely a barrier. So there are, are plenty of obstacles and, and you'll, I promise you, you'll, you'll recognize more as you think more about teaching about teams. And um, some of them are listed here, having a shared definition. We have professional silos that remain to exist. Uh, maybe this is something we don't value, we don't prioritize. Um, it's hard to evaluate learning outcomes. We don't know what difference it's ultimately gonna make for them. There can be health system factors. Um, so there's a, a lot of barriers to both IP and collaborative practice, and some of those are the same. But just as our challenges are also facilitators, and I think these are the ones that we need to be thinking about. Some of them I've covered already. I do think that we are reimagining some of our pre-licensure education in clinical and classroom settings as part of the new center's charge. Um, we also need to be clear on what, what, is, what are the competencies? What are we striving for? What do we want our students to learn? Um, there is this notion of IP champion. So if you are someone who who is passionate about IP, I encourage you to keep doing what you're doing, uh, learn up, get involved with the center because we are gonna need uh, people who are real excited about this to lead the way. And we do need to remember that this is not just nice, this is a part of our job. Um, and that um, while sometimes these might be considered softer skills, they are hard to do and they make uh, quite a bit of difference for patients and, our, and their communities. So let's, let's take a quick look at the four competencies that I previously mentioned. And before we think about competencies, which can be sort of bland and unidimensional and um, you know, sort of words on paper, I really want you to think about the students we work with, right? The learners, think about yourselves, think about the residents, right? Think about them and where you want them to be um, after their training is complete. So here's an image of the four competencies. And as you can see, they're sort of designed in a community and population orientation that are both patient and family centered. And at the bottom, you see that arrow that indicates that this is something that we are continuously working on. By category, um, we have four in total. We have the values and the ethics. We have our roles and responsibilities. We have our communication. And then we have our teams and our teamwork. And, and you can read these and each of these need to be purposely pursued with our, our learners and with ourselves. Some of these might be harder than others. I mentioned before that as the Division of Neuroimmunology has grown, we've had many discussions about the roles and the responsibilities and tasks and task delegation and cross coverage and, and, it, and it's changed over time. Um, I have uh, ne never and truly me never have encountered an issue in, in uh, the division with values and ethics around teams. And that's something that has um, been sort of inspired for me and motivates me to do the work that I do around team-based practice. Uh, interprofessional communication can be hard. I think we can all think of times where we've had difficulty with conflict resolution or transitions in care or handoffs. Um, you know, interactions with other members of the healthcare team. And then of course, teams and teamworks is even a little bit more complicated in terms of our own dynamics. So th th this is hard work. And as we look at these four competencies, um, we need to think about not only ourselves as I described, but what do we want our students to know about the teams that we work on, right? Um, so I know when I work with, with students, I let them know, here's who's in the clinic, here's how I interact with them, and you should do some of that interacting too. And we'll talk about facilitation in a few more minutes. Just like any good competency framework, these are the broad categories, but you all know from LCME and your areas of education, ACGME, there's always a competency, then there's like you know 10 to 20 sub-competencies, and that's the case for these two. I didn't want to overwhelm anyone, but just give you all a sense of what's out there, but also how much is out there. So how do we take all that and sort of translate that to, well, I have a medical student with me this week or this month. And I know there's a lot of medical students and some PA students and pharmacy students, right? So as we think about where we wanna get them in the time they have with us in the Department of Neurology, here is an example from the literature in 2017 that states some, some I think, quite achievable objectives that they set for their learners. 
And sometimes this is part of a formal evaluation. Sometimes it's more in informal. Um, but I do think that I share this because I think it's doable. I also want to spend just a moment sharing some of the ACGME and core neurology requirements. And this is just selections from them. There are more about teams that are listed, but I, I share this to underscore that um, there's uh, alignment between both pre licensure education and graduate medical education. Uh, and I would add that, um, as you can see here, in terms of faculty qualifications, um, resident needs to demonstrate competence and even the curriculum organization and the resident experience teams is a part of it, right? So this is a part of our job as clinician educators and as programs. And here's just the, uh, the milestones here. So you can see a lot of this has to do with uh, consultations, both receiving and making consultations, how, uh, how effective communication is, active listening, um, coordination of care with other members of the healthcare team, soliciting feedback. And if you look at level five, which I think is so important in terms of how we think about facilitating IPE is how we role model our, our team work um, all the time, but, it's, but uh, including when learners are present. So all that being said, we're gonna talk about how, how do we do this? Okay, so it's, it's a priority, it's part of our job, it's, it's pretty challenging, there's you know, there's, there's uh, facilitators to that. How can we become facilitators of interprofessional education? So at Duke, uh, like a lot of things, we have uh, tradition and we have innovation. And with interprofessional education and the pre-licensure programs, um, I would say most of it has occurred formally in the classroom phases. And we, we've done some, but not a ton. Um, I think more of it has occurred informally in clinical settings, and we want to be more deliberate about that. And that's part of why I'm here today is to make, make sure we have more hands uh, doing this work for our students in our clinical environments. And then we can think about co-curricular and service learning activities. I'm not asking you to do all this. I just want you to have a sense of where are the places where we can facilitate interprofessional education. And the two areas where I would encourage you all to think about, I know, I know many of you teach in classroom settings and small groups, whether it's on neurology topics or more general health topics for, I think, I think within, within the, the Duke School of Medicine and its programs, including the MDPA uh, PT program, there's a new OT program for those of you who don't know that's starting this fall. Um, which is very exciting, but also in the School of Nursing. And then in the community, if you're lecturing at, at, at conferences, at other um, educational programs, or even talk, uh, teaching in the community, think about talking about teams um, and, and, and what that means for care of patients with neurologic disorders, certain conditions, whatever topic you're presenting. And our primary uh, focus for the next uh, 10 minutes here or so as we talk about IP facilitation is really in clinical settings where I know we all are on a regular basis. So let's dive in. A couple of things I wanted to share from some research I've done here at Duke. And, and these are both studies that have been done with preceptors. This was a survey of our PA student preceptors, which included neurology providers. Um, we found that students are more likely to um, have interprofessional encounters at academic medical centers and in specialty settings. So that's us, okay, Duke Neurology. Uh, we also found that students are more likely to interact with professionals 7.1 in terms of at least monthly encounter compared to non-PA students, right, 1.8. So as we think about collaborative practice, we need to think about, yes, let's get the learners together, but let's get our learner or learners with other members of the healthcare team. And we also uh, found in that survey that preceptors do are, are assessing students in a professional practice competency. So this is something that seems to be a priority for us as clinician educators and evaluators. Um, so I think in terms of our own faculty development, we wanna make sure we know what we're evaluating in terms of competencies. In a separate study we did a year later, uh, this involved interviews with preceptors. And uh, a few of the themes that we found was that preceptors define IPE differently. No shocker there, right? And I bet if we all sort of gave our own definition of collaborative practice, they would be a bit different and that's okay. But we also need to have a shared framework as we think about ourselves as educators. We learned that students learn about teams by being a part of teams. So we shouldn't just talk about teams, but get them on the team, get them interacting with those members of the team. Preceptors also shared that they would actually separate students to avoid diluting the learning experience. That was sort of a, a shocker finding. So um, that can be a barrier to IPE, right? Is we don't want too many learners together because then they see less patients. So we need to figure that out. 
And lastly, our preceptors identified a, a couple real, I think, doable ways to facilitate IPE, including introducing students to members of the healthcare team and role modeling team skills. Um, so some lessons from our colleagues here at Duke. So a brief summary before we get to some specifics, and I wanna hear from you. So as we think about facilitating IPE, we need to think, you need to think about yourself and your team and other learners. Think about the competencies and what are the priorities? Is it, you know, just understanding the value of the team? Is it here's how, here's when our team communicates or here's when our group becomes a team or here's how we deal with task delegation. Of course, the why is around patient safety, health outcomes, but also the provider benefit, right? I think that I would say that, you know, our, 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 the patients I see on Thursdays do much, much better because of the nurse they get to meet and they get to meet Amanda, the MS nurse educator. And they know that, you know, Janelle is, is working on their medication prior authorizations and, and education around that. So um, we need to, we need, I think we sort of know that, but we need to a, thank our colleagues on a regular basis and value them, but also let the learners know why they're making a difference and how they're making a difference. And, when I, and I would argue, I think we can share this with our learners, whether it's their first clerkship or their last clerkship, or we have them for a day or a month. But let's get to the how. So before I share um, a list, I'm going to invite two or three of you to unmute and share how you have facilitated interprofessional education with learners, even if you know you didn't, even if you didn't know you were doing it. Nick, I'll go first. This is Suma. Thanks, Suma. Um, hey. Uh, I think asking our learners to spend time with folks from other disciplines is a good first way to start to get folks to learn what uh, our teams do. So spend, having our fellows spend time with, for us, Janelle or, or Amanda um, for a couple half days as they get introduced to the team. Thanks, Suma. And Suma, when you're, when you're doing that, um... Obviously, it sounds like you're giving your students instructions. How do you talk to sort of the other members of the, of the team, sort of how to anticipate that and how to support the fellows or other learners? Yeah, I think I, I set them up to say, you know, one, are, are you willing to have them? But two, are they able to spend time with you to learn what you do in your role as part of our team so that the expectation is set that they are they are going to be taking on these shadows to help incorporate them and, and teach them into that, that interprofessional team setting. And how's that been received by our team, Sumer? Really well. I mean, I, as you said, our team is fantastic, yeah. but um, I just reached out to them last week, both Amanda and Janelle uh, in the last week, and they said, I'd be happy to have them. Some days can be busier than others, but this way they'll see what my flow is like. Wonderful. Thank you, Suma. Great, great example. Nick, this is Jody. And, um, you know, one way that uh, I try to facilitate this on inpatient rounds is actually asking the nurses about each of the patients. Um, you know, what updates do they have? What concerns and issues do they have? Um, I think a, a barrier can be time. And I think that uh, where I could be better is making sure that before we start rounds that I, I seek out the charge nurse uh, so that she can alert the nurses to the fact that we are rounding um, and really taking the time to, to you know, give them the time to come and join us, um, but then asking for their feedback. Great, thank you, thank you, Jody. Um, great examples, and I think it sort of shows the, the that we need to be thinking about it, that we need to be talking with our team members, um, you know, before the rounds or as we're going to engage them with learners in our setting. Um, absolutely is important. And maybe one more person to share. Hi, this is Nada. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I think uh, stroke is one of these disciplines that has a lot of interdisciplinary teams, um, and we have meetings three times a week. Uh, with the entire team, including speech therapists, nutritionists, occupational therapists, um, physical therapists, uh, pharmacists, NP, uh, the physicians uh, and the fellows and the residents on the team. So I think that's a great example. Um, 
unfortunately, there's nothing that translates into the outpatient. Once you're in the outpatient world, our clinic doesn't have that structure. Thank you, Nada. Another excellent example. And, and, and I think, you know, you remind us, Nada, that we can think about, are there, are there, um, settings within our own our own department and care settings that are more optimal for for teaching about teams right and we could probably do a little bit of it everywhere but maybe there are places where it's it's again particularly well suited for team teaching and that's where we do more of it that's where it's deliberate allow it to happen other places naturally as it does but where it can be prioritized and i certainly encourage others to share in the chat other ways that you facilitated ipe so here's a list that I wanted to share, um, and we've already heard most of this from just three people sharing have covered much of what we've already talked about. And none of this is rock and science, right? Um, there are barriers, there's time, and we need to talk with our colleagues about it, um, about, about setting some of this up, but um, none, none of this is, is rocket science. And I would encourage you to think, what's one thing on this list that you can do the next time you're with a learner? So I wanted to, I'm gonna move through some slides pretty quickly here um, because they're mostly for reference, but I do want you to know that um, IPE is, is uh, present and published in the neurology literature. And this, these are just some selections. So um, one systematic review looked at uh, interprofessional education around delirium care. This isn't one study about IP and delirium care, it's a systematic review. So there are articles about out there and, and these are, uh, many of these uh, programs are for, or publications are about learner or pre-licensure education, but also continuing ed. Um, there have been studies published on the care of patients with stroke, which uh, not importantly remind us of that, that, that the team is really needed there. There um, is a publication about a 16-hour a team-based uh, learning dementia care boot camp for pre-licensure learners um, focused on dementia care competencies, um, emerging as sort of a theme from that. So an interesting topic. Um, movement disorders, um, and sp specifically interprofessional education around the care of patients with Parkinson's disease. And lastly, a, um, a recent study published, brought to our team's attention last week um, by within our own division about how incorporating a clinical pharmacist into a hospital-based neurology clinical team makes a big difference for patients. Um, we know that at Duke, um, we're grateful to have Janelle and other institutions are publishing on this as well. So we need to think about not just interprofessional education in terms of trainees, but also our, our healthcare delivery and team-based care. So I'm going to move past this one, but as, I, as again, I want you to think about, as you think about facilitating interprofessional education, think about who, maybe one person, you, you would connect a learner with the next time. And, um, and as, as Suma said, you know, we have a, a great team, so we're always, you know, trying to at least make introductions and get our learners to have some time with other members of the team. But think about who, who's one person you might connect one of your learners with in the future. And whether it's for an introduction, whether it's for an hour of shadowing, or maybe they spend a half day or even more with them or someone they're gonna see in team rounds. So in our last 10 minutes, um, I just want us to sort of recap and look to the literature a little bit to be informed by it. So in a publication a couple of years ago, one of the sort of uh, IPE gurus described interprofessional education as, as, as a Gordian knot. This is a Gordian knot. And, um, and she described that while it's hard to untangle, let's not cut it, right? So just because something's tough to do doesn't mean we don't work at it. So this is something we all need to work at. And I think if it's something we all work at a little bit, we'll make a big difference. So I encourage you all to think about where you're engaging with students in classrooms or clinical settings. Um, if you're involved with faculty development or team-based care, I'm really thinking about, you know, that, that, that that's collaborative practice, that's IPE, you're already doing it. And recognizing that as, as we become more purposeful about this, there's so much that's been done in the literature. And I know reading the literature takes time, but you may find that you're not only going to do better because you're informed by the literature, but there may be opportunities through scholarship, which we all need to do to disseminate and extend the literature. And we have great models like the one I shared before to help us do that. So a few questions I have for you. What are you interested in, excited about, or already doing around collaborative practice? Who might you partner with to do more? And how can you commit the time? And I bet you the time, if you think about what you're already doing, 
if you think about who you might partner with, that the time issue might not be, be as big of a deterrent as you think. And I do wanna talk about a few opportunities to extend the literature and extend our work. Um, so we're gonna walk through each of these quickly. So one, if you're thinking about IPE, I would encourage you to think about um, situating it in authentic clinical learning environments. So where the learners already are with learners, where the learners already are with teams. And, and you all are already there. Oftentimes I'll, I'll present this or similar information to people who teach more in classroom settings. So I challenge them to think to, to the clinic, you all are already there. So I would say, look around and see who's there and see what formal, more formal planned educational experiences might occur in those settings. The second challenge, I think, to sort of be informed, but also um, learn, learn from and extend the literature is to aim for these higher order learning outcomes. So as we think about where we want our students to get, we don't just want to assess how do you feel about teams, what's your perceptions of a team experience, but we really want them to be working on the communication skills. We really, we really want them to be articulate what's the roles and the responsibilities of other members of the team. When do I refer? How do I communicate using something like SBAR or other team steps tools? Uh, maybe it's, um, you know, maybe our, our students are wondering how we resolve conflicts as teams, right? So we want them to be really acquiring knowledge and skills um, because for this is a, this is a, a table from the article um, that I shared in the previous slide. And essentially, as we think about learning outcomes, the easier ones to assess our reactions and perceptions, but we really wanna be looking at more behavior change. And this is not just for our learners, but this is for ourselves. And lastly, as we think about evaluating learning, learn outcomes, there are dozens, if not hundreds of tools out there. Um, some are good, some are great, none are perfect. Um, but there are uh, four out there that have been recommended for specific settings. So if you do find yourself in a week or a month or a year's time getting more involved in IPE or you want to evaluate something more formally, there's been a lot of work done on it. This article is great. I'm glad to be a resource as well. Um, but uh, don't, don't duplicate work. Don't, I think if we don't, if we be informed by the literature and don't duplicate work, our, our time commitment needs to be uh, less significant. So again, I wanted to reiterate those questions and reiterate the opportunities. Um, I'll sort of remind you, as I've shared earlier, that know that collaborative practice and learning can occur with both learners and providers and really learn from the literature. <coughs> It'll, you'll, you'll move a lot quicker if you do so. And also know that there are sources of support. That's really where I want to end our time here today um, is encourage you all to engage with our new Center for Interprofessional Education and Care. The center is uh, prioritizing early on pre-licensure education programs, but part of our job is collaborative practice across the institution. And we have assistant directors from each of the uh, pre-licensure programs in the Duke School of Medicine, uh, MD, PA, PT, soon to be OT as well, and then a representative from the School of Nursing, and of course our Associate Dean and Director is Mitch Hufflin, who I know many of you know. Uh, so we got a, a great team, but we need more hands than just this. Um, and uh, we are sort of a, the, the center's a, a partnership between both the School of Medicine and Nursing. I won't belabor you with the org chart, but just wanna let you know that it is a collaboration and we are uh, looking at both pre-licensure learning, robust evaluation, uh, research, and also faculty development. And that's one thing that I encourage you all to be on the lookout for if you are interested in more of this is to engage with the center, reach out to me, but uh, the IPEC Center and Duke Ahead are um, our, our strong supporters of faculty development um, through uh, workshops, certificate programs, uh, education grand rounds. So um, look for those opportunities. Um, also know that if you're interested in either a faculty development or student project planned experience that there are intramural grant funding um, for both of those through Duke Head and the IPEC Center. Um, you can probably look for those announcements later this year or in 2022. And of course, Duke has other sources of intramural funding. And then of course, there's extramural grants. And as you are writing grants, perhaps for other purposes, I would encourage you to think about how a team component, a team perspective might be a part of uh, whatever intervention or um, sort of healthcare delivery study you have in mind. A couple other resources. Remember that Duke does have a Center for Health, Safety and Quality and they have an annual conference, they do team steps training. So uh, to, while today was more focused on IPE, if you are interested in more in you know, collaborative practice, um, this, that center is great. Of course, the 
uh, Center for or the Department of Population Health um, has a, a great wealth of resources and, and faculty who, who not only study healthcare delivery and population health, but much of that is team science. And then as I shared before, we have the National Center is a great resource as well. So to sort of end where we began, you know, we're, we're here because of patients and, um, and we're here as teams for patients. And wherever you engage with learners, if it's, if it's a lecture, if it's a clerkship, if you're involved with you know, uh, co-curricular activities, service learning, or you're interested in getting involved with those, um, if you're interested in contributing, if you're interested in leading, please let us know um, because the, the, the students come to Duke for a lot of reasons. And one of those is to be at an academic medical center where they know they're gonna get to interact with different types of learners and, and great provider teams. That's, that's um, what, a big part of what brought me to Duke. Um, it's what keeps me at Duke. It, what, it, it what keeps me in clinic one day a week and in the division that I'm in um, because of, of, of the people and the difference we make. So I'll end with one of my favorite quotes. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And we'll remind you that we get there by teaching about teams, thinking about teams, talking about teams, and where we can researching more about teams. So we can not only catch up and keep up, but where we can lead for our students and our patients. And with that, uh, I think I have a few minutes for any questions or comments or any additional facilitation uh, ideas to share, because I know we heard a few, but there's a couple more in the chat. Uh, thank you, Nick. Uh, anyone with questions, just either speak up or put your question or your name in the chat for Nick. Nick, let me, I'll ask a question. So how can uh, federal like Medicare reimbursement facilitate this? I, I, I imagine finances play a big role and when people are thinking about teams. Yeah, I think um, this is probably gonna be more of a non-answer, but I think we, we more know that the fee for service doesn't necessarily pay for teams, particularly in outpatient settings. Um, and of course the, and I'm, I'm not a, a I don't, I'm an expert on sort of health payment systems, but I do think as we think about sort of delivery on quality, but whatever that is, and I know that a lot, a lot has yet to be defined, um, my wager there's gonna be a, a close look at um, sort of healthcare delivery and what, what models are effective and not expensive and deliver on quality and safety and where it's not about necessarily making bigger teams because that can cost more, but maybe more re rethinking what the care delivery looks like and how we're all spending our time and where other you know, different types of providers and staff, where if they can function at the highest scope of their training and individual ability, can deliver more services. So there can be, I think, a little bit more of an efficacy model there. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I do know some people in population health who would be glad to, who would certainly do more justice to that question, but I think um, there, there are certainly models out there for that. Well, the chat is just filling up with um, accolades. Um, Suma had one last thing to say. Uh, Suma, do you want to just mention that and then we'll call it a day? Yeah, Nick has co-directed the Teach More About Teams course, which is a six weeks I call it a, almost like a seminar on how to learn more about core competencies that come from this interprofessional education and, and care model. Um, so for anyone who wants to think about how that might be brought into team-based practice, which is truly everything that we do as neurologists, um, I think it's, it's a great thing to catch the next iteration of. And, and Rick makes a comment that, uh, um, you know, his ALS clinic is the, is the prime example of a multidisciplinary approach and that he's been able to get funding from an advocacy group for that approach. Rick, yeah, do, you wanna, do you wanna say anything? Yeah, um, it's a little different in ALS because we actually have data <clears throat> to show that team care is associated with improved quality of life and improved length of life. And as a result, you know, because of the challenges in, in getting a team funded, through insurance, we've been able to convince a patient advocacy group to give us a fairly large amount of money to keep our team together and to pay for a coordinator who's our main educator to patients. Yeah. 
and, I, and I, I'll just quickly add, I think, and Rick, that, thanks for sharing that because I was, as I was preparing for this, I was thinking of, we have, we have so many exemplars within our department of, you know, just great, great team-based care. And as we look to, again, sort of the health science, the healthcare delivery literature, we, we need case studies where right? we think about case studies in terms of our medical practice, like, oh, this was an interesting case. We need exemplar cases like what you're doing with the ALS team care. Um, you know, in, in the literature to show how it's working and that it does work and what parts of it don't work, but do work um, to really lead the way. So um, I, I hope you're, if you haven't already considered publishing on that and sharing it, and, um, I, and I, I would wager that there are other, other divisions and other clinics who are, are doing more than you think um, um, in terms of what's needed in the literature to really lead the way. So that's why I really wanted to emphasize the research piece because it's best, best practice, um, you know, is not, is not defined, it's emerged and it emerges through the work that we're doing here. So I would encourage you all to, to, to share it and to get that grant money and to publish it because that's how we get better. And that's also how we advocate for better policy and show the sort of ROI. Okay, uh, thank you again, Nick and have a great day, everybody. You're most welcome. Thanks, everyone.